Well, guys, I want to I wanna go ahead and get started this morning on what we're going to talk about, and um, I'm just going to give you a little inside scoop into my week, okay, before I do anything else. So um, I, was, I was preparing. We have two weeks left in our series on Colossians that we've been in for a long time. And I was doing some studying. I, I had read a lot. I had done all my prep, and I was just starting to write my sermon. And um, before, right after that, I was reading in the book of Acts. Um, and I just kept reading and reading and reading. And I read most of the book of Acts this week as I just, the Lord just kept spurring things on to me, just read a little more, read a little more. And after I finished reading that, I felt very, very strongly that I was supposed to preach out of those texts that I, that I read this week that have really nothing to do with what we've been talking about, but everything to do with what I believe God is calling us to. So before I share with you, I want to just highlight something. If, if you don't know this, the book of Acts is a historical account of the continued ministry of Jesus through the church led by the apostles. Okay, Acts starts in, in Acts 1 with the final words of Jesus to his disciples. Okay, He says, go to Jerusalem before you do anything else. Before you try to fulfill the Great Commission, go to Jerusalem, wait for the Spirit, okay? Then it goes on in Acts 2 to the empowerment of the apostles at Pentecost in receiving the Holy Spirit. Then it moves on to the birth, the growth of the church, and then on to the persecution of the church. And at the very end of Acts, all the way towards the end of, of the very last chapter in Acts, we're experiencing the very last days of Paul. We've seen his whole ministry through this book. So today what we're going to do is we're going to briefly explore this book and this passage um, in, in, in the New Testament of Acts. And I really do believe that this is a now word for us today. I don't say that often, but I really do feel like this is a now word for us today. So for starters, as we, as we have this discussion, how many of you guys have ever seen a 3D movie? Anybody? You got the glasses and the whole, the whole thing. Um, I remember... The first time that I saw a 3D movie, I was a kid. It's when it just came out. Um, it was super, super expensive because it was, it was a big deal. Um, so we go in, and as the movie starts, I'm very interested as a kid to see the difference of what the picture looks like without the glasses, right? So I'm like, they're telling us to wear these glasses. Do I really have to? Again, as a kid, I'm expecting I take off the glasses, and it just looks like a normal Screen, but you put them on, it pops off the page. But to my surprise, I take off my glasses and it's like undiscernible what's on the screen. Like it's fuzzy, it's blurry. You guys know what I'm talking about. You've seen that. It's like a jumbled mess. And, you know, I was like, I'm going to kind of try to watch it like this for a minute as a kid. My eyes started hurting. It was very, you know, just confusing. You couldn't really follow what was happening. Um, but again, put the glasses back on, image becomes clear. And looking back, at that whole experience, I find it really interesting that the actual image itself doesn't change at all. The image stays exactly the same. It's only our perception of that image that changes. If you're wearing the 3D glasses, you see one thing, and if you take those glasses off, you see something else entirely. Now, ironically, the same exact principle holds true when it comes to our view of the gospel. While the gospel absolutely never changes, how we look at it changes everything about how we experience it. No one pays the extra price. I'd like to see the 3D movie and then refuses to wear the glasses, right? That's nuts, okay? Who wants to watch a blurry movie and be lost the whole time? But guys, you see, Jesus, he's paid the price for us to experience newness of life. That's found in the gospel, and it's found in the gospel alone. Yet so many of us just taking the glasses off, and we're living in this blurred out version of the Christian life because of it. We're not seeing things clearly. We're not seeing things as the church, the way that we ought to see them. We don't see ourselves. We don't see others. We don't see our world through the lens of Christ and his work and his love. And because of it, our lives lack clarity and intention and focus that they ought to have. So again, despite an unchanging gospel, our vision of that message unfortunately changes. So what we once received with probably great emotion, probably great gratitude, and a lot of passion in responding to the gospel, now it's just kind of sifted down into another part of our lives. And guys, today we have to adjust how we see the gospel. This year we have to adjust how we respond to the gospel. 
If we do not adjust our vision, then we're going to miss out on living in the daily purpose and the daily mission that Christ alone has for his people. So we're going to lead, read a lot of scripture today. We're going to look at, at what God has to say about this. And I want to encourage you to interact with these passages as though it's the first time you're hearing them. You see, after Jesus ascends into heaven, and after the apostles are filled, are filled with the Holy Spirit and with power at Pentecost, Peter immediately goes outside at night, and he just starts preaching in the streets. He's had this experience with God, and he just starts telling people about it. Some think that they're drunk. They're, they're, talk, they're speaking in tongues. It's unintelligible. Other people are hearing, that's my language, and no one else in this area knows that language. So people are like, no, they're drunk. And Peter says, no, we're not drunk. We're full of something, but it's not alcohol. It's the Spirit of God. And he begins to talk about how this happens, and he preaches this message and at the very end of the message in Acts 2, verses 36 on, he says, So let everyone in Israel know for certain that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, to be Lord and Messiah. Peter's words pierce the hearts. And they said to him and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter replied, Each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is to you, to your children, and to those far away, all who have been called by the Lord our God. Then Peter continued preaching for a long time, strongly urging all his believers, save yourselves from this crooked generation. Those who believed what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day, about 3,000 in all. So guys, Peter has this willingness to be obedient to the commission that Jesus had given him weeks earlier, okay, known as the Great Commission in Matthew 28. And him being obedient results in the number of these believing folks to go from hundreds to thousands overnight. And the crazy thing to me is that Paul didn't stop there. I mean, I want you to imagine you just led 3,000 people to the Lord one night. That'd be like, man, I'm going to take tomorrow off. Like, that's awesome, right? Peter did not. The apostles did not. Skipping ahead to Acts 4. While Peter and John were speaking to the people, they were confronted by the priest, the captain of the temple guard, and some of the Sadducees. These leaders were very disturbed that Peter and John were teaching the people that through Jesus there is the resurrection of the dead. They arrested them, and since it was already evening, put them in jail until morning. But many of the people who heard their message believed, so the number of men who believed now totaled about 5,000. So he just keeps going. They just keep on going. They keep sharing this message with, about Jesus with every single person that will listen, every single person that will actually entertain them walking up and saying, listen, have you heard about this, this Christ? Have you heard about Jesus? The message of redemption, wholeness, and life. It was the most important thing on their to-do list every single day. People were being healed. Lives were being transformed, and they were sharing their resources with those who didn't have food because of famine, they were selling their property and giving the proceeds to people who literally had nothing and were in poverty. I want you to notice two things about Peter and John. The first is that they were obedient to the gospel. They were obedient. The second was that they were persistent. They were obedient, but they weren't just obedient. They were also persistent. And Peter and John continued to share this message with others no matter what they were accused of no matter what came against them and the obstacles they face. <clears throat> in Acts 2, we read that after this initial sermon, 3,000 people come to know Jesus. And then after that, it says, Peter continued preaching for a long time, strongly urging all his listeners. As if we're to be honest, most of us would admit that most of the time, we're not all that obedient in reaching out to others with the transformational message of Christ. We simply think it's someone else's job to share the gospel. But even if we do share the gospel with an individual, we pat ourselves on the back and we stop there. We don't continue. We have our good deed for the, for the month, for the year even. But not everyone sees it that way. You see, all of these miracles are happening. All these amazing things are happening in the church. And, and the church is excited, but not everyone else was ex as excited as they were. In Acts 4, 13, 21, God had just healed a man who was crippled and had been crippled from birth. And afterwards, in verse 13, it says this, the members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John. Get this. For they could see that they were ordinary men, 
with no special training in the Scriptures. They also recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing right there among them, there was nothing the council could say. So they ordered Peter and John out of the council chamber and conferred among themselves. What should we do with these men? They asked each other. We can't deny that they performed a miraculous sign. and Everybody in Jerusalem knows about it. But to keep them from spreading their propaganda any further, we must warn them not to speak to anyone in Jesus' name again. So they called the apostles back in and commanded them never again to speak and teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, Do you think God wants us to obey you rather than him? We cannot stop telling about everything we have seen and heard. The council then threatened them further, but they finally let them go because they didn't know how to punish them without starting a riot. Now, guys, there's just so much here. Did you notice what the, the high council noticed? These men had no special training in the scriptures. But they also recognized that Peter and John had been with Jesus. You may not feel qualified to share the gospel with people in your life. But let me tell you this morning, the qualifications are pretty simple. Have you been with Jesus? Have you been with Jesus? When people look at us and they recognize and say, wow, they're different. Wow, when all of this political mess is going on and they look at people who are grounded, when they're looking at violence happening all over our nation, whether it's racial or hatred, whatever it is, and people are grounded. They see people that are, that are living their lives rooted in something deeper than the circumstances around them. They say, wow, there, there's something different going on in that person's life. Guys, our witness with our mouth has to be backed by our daily lives, decisions, and actions. Then we get to begin to point towards saying, hey, why don't you enter into a life of discipleship in following Jesus rather than just trying to get someone to pray a magic prayer so they don't go to hell and checking it off our list like we did a good thing. People need the gospel to not just receive, but to, to, to grow within them, to, to be fully formed in them. And guys, I can't, I can't say this clearly enough about how we think about the gospel. The gospel isn't about avoiding hell. It's not about scaring people into heaven. It's about dead people having newfound life. It's about people who would be eternally lost, finding purpose and life and wholeness. Now, these threats, that, that's all we've seen so far. The apostles, they're, they're spreading this gospel. Thousands are coming to, to know Jesus, and they're threatening them, saying, listen, do not continue to do this. Trying to use their power and their position to say, don't do it again or else. But it actually didn't just stay as threats. As they continued to be obedient, as they continued to be persistent in sharing about Jesus, much more took place. Skipping ahead to Acts 6, Verses 8 through 12 and 55 and beyond, we have a major event happen in the history of the church. Verse 8 says this, Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed amazing miracles and signs among the people. But one day, some men from the synagogue of freed slaves, as it was called, started to debate with him. They were Jews from Cyrene, Alexandria, Cilicia, and the province of Asia. None of them could stand against the wisdom and the spirit with which Stephen spoke. So they persuaded some men to lie about Stephen, saying, we heard him blaspheme Moses and even God. This roused the people, the elders and the teachers of religious law. So they arrested Stephen and brought him before the high council. Stephen then defends himself. And he says, how dare you accuse me of blaspheming? He says, name one prophet. One prophet that your people did not persecute. And at the very end of his, of his speech, in verse 55, Stephen, it says this, But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed steadily into heaven and saw the glory of God. And he saw Jesus in the place of honor at God's right hand. And he told them, Look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing in the place of honor at God's right hand. Then they put their hands over their ears and began shouting. They rushed him. They, they dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. His accusers took off their coats and laid them at the feet of a young man named Saul, who is later the man who wrote Colossians that we've been studying. As they stoned him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He fell to his knees, shouting, Lord, don't charge them with this sin. And with that, he died. 
Acts 12, 1 through 4, about that time, King Herod Agrippa began to persecute some believers in the church. He had the apostle James, John's brother, killed with a sword. When Herod saw how much this pleased the Jewish people, he also arrested Peter. This took place during the Passover celebration. Then he imprisoned him, placing him under the guard of four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring Peter out for public trial after the Passover, but that didn't happen because an angel of the Lord came, rescued Peter, and miraculously led him out of prison. Acts 4, 19 and 20. Then some Jews arrived from Antioch and Iconium and won the crowds of their size. They stoned Paul and dragged him out of town, thinking he was dead. But as the believers gathered around him, he got up and went back into town. He went back into town. Acts 16, 20 through 24, a mob quickly formed against Paul and Silas, and the city officials ordered them stripped and beaten with wooden rods. They were severely beaten, and then they were thrown into prison. The jailer was ordered to make sure that they didn't escape, so the jailer put them into the inner dungeon, where there would have been feces, filth, disease, clamped their feet into, their feet into stocks. Now, guys, we literally do not have the time this morning for me to continue on. We're in Acts 16, 18 right now, okay? We don't have time to read the rest of the ways that these apostles were beaten, bruised, whipped, flogged, stoned, beheaded, burned, crucified, imprisoned, and so on, simply for doing one thing, sharing the gospel of Jesus. But remember, what did they say when they were asked, stop this? We cannot stop talking about everything we've seen and heard. However, for you and I, despite freedom of speech, despite protected religious liberties, and constant contact with the lost in our day-to-day -day lives, we can't make ourselves start sharing the gospel with the people who are lost. Now, why is that? Why is that? Why is it that we've settled for a version of the Great Commission that cannot be found in any of the Gospels? It cannot be found in Matthew 28. Why is it that we've grown so complacent with simply going through the motions while we watch people around us live without hope, without freedom, without the rescue and love of Christ in their lives? Why do we refuse to share the thing, the only thing, with others that can actually redeem them and renew them in Christ? And guys, I'm convinced, and as I was praying this week, I felt like the Lord just gave me three very simple things that I want to share with you. Three very simple things, three errant patterns in our lives that cause us to be robbed from the commission that Jesus has given us. The first is just selfishness. Just selfishness. Maybe we're just too selfish to be embarrassed by bringing up Jesus to someone who doesn't follow being labeled, being rejected, being thought of. Too selfish to stop with our own goals, our own priorities, our own concerns. To make time for the people who are marginalized, for the people who are broken and most desperately need help. Maybe we're too selfish to place the commands of Jesus before our personal calendar. To bring someone who needs to be at church because we'd rather just have our family time. Maybe it's not selfishness. Maybe it's blindness. Blindness to how many people around us are truly destined for death instead of life. Maybe it's blindness to our responsibility to share the gospel with others. Blind to the mandate that Jesus gave to his people. He didn't say, guys, if you're feeling good this week, maybe you could possibly share this message with someone you know. He said, go and make disciples baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Blindness to our own hearts and the apathy that's formed within them to the eternal purposes of God. It's just being calloused. And the last is distractedness. Maybe we're just too distracted with our own problems to think about anyone else. Maybe we're so distracted by the temporal to see that we actually can live with an eternal perspective. It doesn't matter if it's circumstantial distraction, relational distraction, political distraction, possessional distraction by the things that we want to get. We cannot accept to live distracted towards the mission of God that is the church. And guys, I want to tell you this. It's so important that we understand this theologically. The church just doesn't have a mission. The church is a mission. 
okay? So we have a mission statement on our, on our website. You can go and look at it. But if we're, that's to help non-believers understand what we're about. When we begin to talk theologically about what the church is, the church is a mission. It's not a building. It's not you. It's not me. It's us, okay? And it's when all of us are doing our part in expanding the kingdom of God that we're living in the gospel, that we're being the people we've been called to be. We are the hands and the feet of a crucified king. We are the people of God who bring with us the presence of God. And when we fail to act and we fail to pick up our duty to bring that message and that presence and that life to others, the mission of God dies with us. In the jungles of India, there's this really unique and very interesting way that poachers will go to trap monkeys, okay? And what they do is they set up these monkey traps, and the poachers will start with a cage that is very simple. Two things, cage, banana, ironically. Monkeys, they love bananas, right? Cage, monkey. So what they do is they'll make sure that the holes in the cage are large enough for the monkey's hand to be able to fit through. But they'll make sure that the holes are not large enough for the monkey's fist be able to fit through while grasping a banana. Now, what's so interesting about this is that every time the monkey will go to the cage, the monkey will grab the banana, and the monkey will refuse to let go. To live in freedom, by the way, all the monkey would have to do, as the poachers are literally walking up to it to imprison it, is let go of the banana and run away. Nothing is holding the monkey there other than his own stubbornness, but it refuses. Now, you can look at videos of this. The monkey will kick, bite, scream, wail, and fight, but they will not let go, and they always end up captured because of their grip. Now, church, I think so many of us have been captured by that same exact mechanism. Even though what we refuse to let go of is not a banana, our grip has nevertheless imprisoned us to an experience that is counter to the life directed by Christ, his commission in his gospel. So my question is, what is it that we refuse to let go of? If we just let go of it and ran away, we wouldn't have to live imprisoned. Why is it that we refuse to let go? And what is it that we're refusing to let go of? It's our comfort. It's just comfort. We've grown so comfortable that we struggle to even relate to the early church in any way. I mean, I read that, and I, I cannot relate to that. Now, I, I shared the gospel with a couple of people in the last couple of weeks, and that's not to pat myself on the back. I'm telling you that when I read this, I weep. I wept this week. We don't know what persecution is, and so many voices in the church right now are crying out, we're being persecuted, and I say, no, we're not. We're not being persecuted. I'm not being dragged out of Radford and beaten with wooden rods. We're not imprisoned right now. We have to be people who see this differently. We have to loosen our grips on the things that we think we need. And brothers and sisters, I believe deeply within my soul that God is calling us as always as church to be faithful in this that we might wake up from the slumber of Western comfort in what we believe we've been entitled to and begin to realize that, you know what? I'm not called to live comfortably. I'm called to live relentlessly, persistently, obediently to the gospel of Jesus that saved me. We have to allow the essentials to crumble away. We have to allow our hearts to realign with Christ. We have to see people differently. We have to look at them differently to talk to people that we see every day with renewed vision, realizing that we can offer them something that perhaps no one else is going to have the courage to. Now, guys, when I was 16 years old, I went on a missions trip. I went to Labadee, Haiti. And Haiti is known as one of the poorest countries in the entire world. And I went there at 16 years old, and it wrecked me. Now, the things I saw there will forever be imprinted in my mind. The poverty, the hurt, the brokenness, the oppression of the leadership there, it was a mess. And we did all sorts of things there. We built three different small houses for villagers. We went to orphanages and ministered and loved on kids. We, we gave out shoes to, to families and kids and adults that didn't have shoes. And um, 
of all the things I remember about that trick, I remember one day we were ministering uh, at an orphanage and I was asked, hey, you know, I'm 16. Hey, would you be willing to present the gospel? And there was, you know, a lot of people there for a 16 year old. There was probably well over a hundred people there. So I said, you know what? Yes, I will do that. Um, and I vividly remember I'm standing, I'm standing in the middle of a dirt field and people are in a giant circle around me. And we'd been doing songs with the kids and all sorts of things. And um, so I, I presented the gospel and I had a translator because they didn't speak English. They, they spoke, spoke Creole. So I present the gospel and I remember seeing hands and I remember leading people through a prayer to come to know Jesus for the first time in my life. Now I think back to that memory, guys, and it might surprise you to think that that memory for me is very bittersweet. It's a great memory of consolation for me, considering it was one of the first times that I led people, anyone to the Lord. But guys, it's also a memory of great desolation for me for the very same reason. It's sad to me that it took me traveling over a thousand miles to a foreign country in Haiti to share the gospel with someone. When every single day in my high school and in my job after school, I was encountering broken people, lost people, people who were enslaved to drugs and all sorts of things. And I didn't say anything. Isn't it sad that one of the first times I remember sharing the gospel, I was speaking to people who didn't even speak English. Guys, no longer can we neglect to take personal ownership, personal responsibility to share the message with others that has utterly and completely revolutionized our lives. Fortunately, guys, we don't have to settle in this for another moment. What we see from scripture as we close right now, is that the gospel is all about being sent. That's what the gospel is. It's about being sent. The same gospel that sends Jesus to earth is the same gospel that sends Peter to the streets on the night of Pentecost. The same gospel that sent Philip the eunuch, who, by the way, would have been considered the most marginalized person in society. Not only was he uh, from Africa, but on top of that, he was a eunuch. So he would have been mistreated. He would have been marginalized. Jews wouldn't have spoken to him. But the gospel sent Philip to where nowhere else would go. On top of that, that same gospel sent Ananias to Saul, the most feared in church society. He was killing Christians. But the gospel sent a man. And because of that, we have all the epistles. We have all of the, the New Testament that we now see. That same gospel that sent Stephen and countless others to their faithful death and martyrdom in the midst of persecution is the same gospel that sent those with such flawed past. Like Paul, who killed Christians, and Peter, who denied Christ, they led the global church. Peter led the global church to the Jews. Paul led the global church to the Gentiles. Now, guys, this gospel is not dormant. It's not a set of facts that we remember, memorize. It's not something we write on our hand in three points. It's the life that God has transformed within us. I used to be dead, but I'm not anymore. I used to have no hope, but I have hope now. I used to be lost, but now I'm found. That, that is the gospel. So guys, my challenge to us as we go into 2021, where we're in the middle of a pandemic, and we're in the middle of unrest all around us, is to be people who truly are sent with the gospel as you move into tomorrow, as you move into this week, to begin to see that the task Jesus has given us as his people is to become like him. And part of becoming like him is sharing him with other people. Let's pray together. Jesus, right now, I, I, this, I just want to ask you, what, what has God been speaking to you today? Just, just ask yourself that question. What, God, what are you speaking to me today? Three questions. How's your vision? Has it been compromised by selfishness, blindness, distractedness? If so, all we have to do is repent. Lord, forgive me for living selfish. Forgive me for living blind. Forgive me for living distracted and and remind me, help me put on those glasses so that the image that once changed my life will pop off the screen once again. Second question, what are you grasping? 
Are you holding on to comfort? Or are you seeking obedience and persistence in God's mission? Last question, who is God sending you to? Who is it in your life that needs Jesus that you just might be the only person who had the courage to invite them to church? You might just be the only person with the courage to say, hey, can I talk to you about my life with Jesus? You might be the only person to share with them the thing that will make all the difference in eternity for them. Lord, we need our vision readjusted today. And I pray that in the same way you reminded me this week and brought me to tears, that you would bring all of us to tears in the ways that we have neglected being your sent people. This isn't me preaching at my brothers and sisters. As a church, Lord, we receive this word. And we, we pray that this week in our jobs, in our families, even in the people we do not know, we would be ready to say, hey, can I share something with you? This may seem random, but I just felt like the Lord wanted you to know that he loves you. Give us boldness. Lord, not just to break awkward silences, but give us the boldness of Peter and John, where even if we're mocked or ridiculed, we say, I cannot stop sharing what I have experienced, seen, and heard. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for the gospel. We thank you for the fact that you've changed our lives, and we ask it in your name. Amen. Can you give him praise? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Well, I can't fit of a, think of a more fitting time to take communion, right? So we're going to take communion. I forgot mine over here. I'm going to grab it real quick. If you forgot yours, feel free to go grab it in the back. Just put a mask on and we'll, uh, we'll partake together. Guys, the, the blood of Jesus has changed everything. It's changed everything, not just about our future, but about our present. And today we just want to live in that. And we don't just want to be reminded of it mentally. We want to live in it. We want to experience and, and bring this message to others. That Lord, the same way you rescued me, you can rescue any single person. The person who's watching the first Christian get killed, Stephen, becomes Paul. That's the hope of Jesus. So let's, let's respond to it today. Lord, we give you our lives. We give you our hope. We, we root ourselves in you. Would you just, would you do something in us? Would you wake us up, God? That we wouldn't be complacent, but that would be refilled. And in the same way, I want to remind you guys, everything that we just read in Acts, it didn't happen just because they were bold and obedient. It happened because they were filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. So Lord, as we partake today, we're praying not just that we would have a vision change and a mindset change, but Lord, that you would fill us with the power of the Holy Spirit. The boldness that comes not from our own minds, but it's birthed from you and passed on to us. So we receive it. We ask it in your name. Amen.